Alright, so we're going to move on to the new business, the automation contact. contract. So it came up with a this couple of new library directors, this term of what is the automation contact, and so I was explaining the role of the automation contact and actually then discovered that the piece of paper that we were having people sign was from at the time frame when we went from ERA to, to Horizon, and it was still in that era where, I mean, years ago, those of you with very long memories will remember that we really did try to have there be one, maybe two points of contact at a library. And mm -hmm. we don't do that anymore. You know, um, we don't say, oh, only James can call us from Zimbroda, and if there's a problem, the Zimbroda staff has to talk to James, and then James has to call us. If, when there's a problem, the library staff, yes, you should probably talk to James, but if James is not there, James is occupied, the problem needs to get fixed. So um, we still like having, so we've been taking phone calls from whomever needs to call us. Um, I do still think that there is a role for someone at each library to have a little bit more information. Um, so we've, uh, we've moved from having one or two to the library can designate as many automation contacts as they would like. Um, but do we still feel that there needs to be somebody who can act as our point of contact and might take on additional responsibilities. I mean, you, you might decide you don't want everybody in your telecom closet. Um, so Donovan and Tyler and I sat down with the old 2005 copy, which had been approved by this group in November of 2004, and decided that we needed some major editing because the world had changed. So. Um, the copy that some of you I know may have, I'm looking at Cherry's copy, is the, the Word doc that we originally sent out. And then in an effort to try and maybe move to paperless, um, Donovan has created a web form. So, um, general concept, are we going in the right direction? It looks good to me as long as we can name you know, at least one and then a back up. I don't have any problems with that, Peggy. You need to tell us who it is yeah. that has, you feel has more comfort level in the technology area so that we can go to them. But, you know, the person that Dave needs to talk to at Albert Lee is going to be maybe the diff different person than whom Cheryl needs to talk to or whom Tyler needs to talk to if we're talking training at, in your location. In James's location, Stewartville, you know, yours, Pat, there's, there's, there's three of you. <laughs> You might so, want to talk to different people, though. For you might. Well, it depends on what the issue is, I think, too. Sometimes. Yeah. Um, can they all come to users meetings? Uh, Absolutely. Can I send them to the users? Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll train whomever you send us, and all the meetings are open. So if you want to send three people to user group, that's fine. Do you have some actual suggestions editing, you know, looking at wordsmithing? I thought it was very good. Simple, straightforward. I mean, the shorter the simpler the better. Okay. I have a question. So do you ever find that it's an issue? As in, has it ever been an issue that you had, didn't have somebody or two people designated? I mean, has that ever really been an issue from your perspective, from your side of things? Um, I would say that it's been more of an issue with we have to be very, we have to be, cognizant of which site we're dealing with. There may be sites that um, the comfort level of the staff member at that site or the staff member that we're talking to at that site is not the person who is as comfortable as, as maybe another location. I mean, there are, and we're dealing with 90 locations, 400 users, and the technology comfort level expertise um, varies. So I, I would say that's more of an issue. I'm not on the help desk, so. How do you know, if there, we have, when we did all of our conversion and everything, we labeled all of our cores. Well, now the labels are all gone. So it would really be nice if someone could come to the location, go over what we've got in the back, so when they tell us pull cord number C, we don't pull cord number F. 
Okay. And you know, just kind of go over exactly what we have, where everything is. We can relabel stuff. You know, we had a new copier and it was forever. You know, it took us two weeks to get a program. We had to call Delco and Delco had to give us the IP and then the city had to give us the IP and all that kind of stuff. And we couldn't figure out where to stick the thing because all the labels were falling off. So it was a good job. <laughs> yeah, we can we can certainly oh, yeah, we, we can certainly always uh, just contact the help desk and we can certainly have someone come out. It doesn't have to be an immediate problem for one of us to come out and do oh, something. Yeah, I think we just be good to give a good overview. This is where this is. Because a lot of times, you know, even with Sarah's go pull this or go pull that, I think we need, I think ours has probably gotten a little bit more scary than it should be. Sure. Well, that's why we were... Can I answer your question? Way. Yes and no. Okay. But, you know, like, in, so one of the things is like in Peggy's situation, let's say where Dave decides that, you know, he has to do this, oh, i got to go and all these new routers in, which is one project that happened last year. Um, does he actually go pull the file and say, yep, I need to call so-and-so, and then he does? Okay. So I'm just wondering, I was just wondering what the practicalities of this are, if this is really necessary at all. It's not so much for incoming support issues, yeah. like when you call into the help desk, it's more for outgoing. When we know something needs to be done at the library, we need to. We want to have someone we can contact there who will probably have the expertise to help us. And so rather than just call the library and just take whoever happens to answer the phone and start talking to them about routers, we like to have someone on file who has been designated not by us but by the library as the person that we're supposed to call with these kinds of things. That's a good point, Tyler. Thank you because you're right. That's part of the difference. We will, if it makes it makes sense that if the call has come in from somebody, there's an interest whether. It's an interest because they're the one who discovered the problem or they're the one that's on staff that day. It may or may not be the expertise. But we'll call the person back because they've got the background that we've been dealing with. So the incoming calls usually we go back, correct, to the person who started the call unless the local site says, I'm not going to be there, so now call Pat. But so the difference is, is that when we're, we're, when we're initiating it. Yeah, the, the help desk really confused the issue quite a bit. There was a time when it worked both ways. The only people who were supposed to be calling us were the automation contacts. And when I got here back in 2000, and I'm sure Ann remembers this, each library was allowed to have one automation contact, and that was it. Um, after a while, we opened that up to two or more in recognition that people actually do go home sometimes or they do go on vacation or get sick or whatever. Um, but then when we created the help desk, we decided just to go completely the other way and say, anybody can call the help desk. We, we don't care if they're an automation contact or not. So that's where the whole incoming versus outgoing thing goes. But we've continued to use it when we need to contact you. The other thing I would mention besides um, support information is communication. And that's one of the more important roles of the automation contact. When me or Tyler or one of the others needs to send information out to all the libraries, we're going to do an upgrade, or we've got something going on, or something like that. I want to send this last weekend day in, Ron. Yeah, we send that to. As a general rule, we send that to directors and automation contacts. Um, what we've heard in the past is that most of the libraries don't want us bombing everybody with those emails, so we don't just do a send all kind of thing. Um, we send those two groups and then the understanding is, is that the automation contact in particular is responsible for making sure everybody at the library gets the word who needs to hear about it. And we include the directors as well as just sort of a fail safe. And a lot of times it's the same person but not always. So there's a communication role for the automation contact which is really important. And it's really especially important when we're talking about evening and weekend staff who typically are the last ones to hear about anything because that's just the way it is. Well, and I know for school, for us, with how we share our librarians, you know, you might not be at your other building for three days. Something needs to be done or heard. But that doesn't mean you don't want to know what's going on at that contact. You know, Vicki called in for mail, but Marietta hasn't been there for three days. Marietta still needs to know because she may have a bit of information that Vicki wasn't aware of or whatever, you know, so having that contact person yet at Marietta is helpful because she has a uh, working knowledge where Vicki just, or Vicki has, you know, just is a paraprofessional and works well at that building, but she may not have all the other information available. 
that. Well, when getting back to the help desk, we have, you were talking about people calling in with questions. Um, we've had kind of a problem the last couple of years calling the help desk. It's not something that we like to do unless it's absolutely necessary. And that's because there are certain people that when they would answer, they were trying to come up with all these ways to help us. And that's not, we pretty much know who we need to talk to, but we know we're not supposed to be doing that. So the question is, when you call in and, you know, state whatever the problem is, some people are really good. They'll just say, okay, I got it, and I'll check with so-and-so, and they'll get back to you. But it's this other thing that we ran into, and um, we it was a real uh, sticky issue on one of these. And, I mean, we still have one ticket out there floating around because it's never, the individual who we were supposed to work with has never finished it. And as far as we're concerned, it is a done deal. You know, we're not going to do any more with it. But you get all kinds of varying types of answers when you call. And I just wondered, can there be something a little more standardized on that? I mean, some people I call, I have no idea if they're going to do anything. I don't know who they are. They never tell us who they are. And they'll just say, OK, I'll take care of it. Well, I can tell you what's supposed to happen. As things stand right now, what's supposed to happen when you call the help desk is whoever takes your ticket or takes your call is supposed to write up a request. And then that goes to the appropriate support group. But even before that, every person who's on the help desk is supposed to identify themselves when they answer the phone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, sure. Yeah. Right. But that thing, she doesn't even know sometimes. So there, there are a couple of people here who don't. Okay. Um, their job is to write up a request, and that's pretty much all they do. We we tell them not to try and address the problem. Um, well, unless, unless they're yeah. already in the group. If, if they're a member of the support group already that deals with that issue, then they can certainly try to address it if they want to. But really, the primary role for that person is to get the information into our help desk software so it can get to the people who deal with the problem. Is there no. any way, if we have something urgent, we can actually get it done? Well, what, well, in a case like that, we give it the, the status one of critical, and typically at that point, whoever created the ticket is also sticking their head out the door and yelling to whoever's on their support group that there's something they need to deal with. Um, but what I want to point out is, is that that's a change. What I just described is a change. When we first created the help desk, we had a somewhat different model. And the idea back then, when we were all young and naive, was that we would train everybody in the department on how to do certain ubiquitous basic things. The idea was that everyone should know how to reboot a sonic wall. Everybody should know how to start day end. That didn't work. We stuck to that for several years. We came up with all kinds of creative ways to try and train. You know, Mike's training people on PC issues and John is trying to train people on Horizon stuff. And what we found out was, was that it's a great theory. It works well for a large help desk organization that has lots of people working on a relatively small number of solutions. For a small staff where there are lots of things, PCs, ILSs, networking gear, websites, where there's lots of different things going on, it just wasn't workable. You, you could not get everyone trained to the level that they would just remember, oh, this is the one time of the year I have to actually deal with a sonic well problem. No matter how much documentation we created, how many conversations we had, it just wasn't working. So about two years ago, after a series of very painful internal conversations, <laughs> um, we changed the model to what I just described for you a minute ago. And part of what we were trying to avoid was those situations where somebody was biting off more than they could chew and not willing to give it up. So we have a model in place. Um, most of the time, it gets followed pretty well. Um, if it's not, you should let me or Tyler know. And that's that's the evolution of how we got to where we are. So I, I suspect that some of what you're talking about may have dated back from when we were struggling a little bit with the earlier model. Yeah. And situations like yours is exactly why we made that change. Well, well please let me know. So Tyler is the help desk manager yeah. in his role of technology support librarian. Well, what I've noticed lately, I mean, we try not to call very often, but in maybe the last six months or so, um, 
it's worked much better the way Donovan is describing. But that other issue we were having, that um, that got to be a nightmare. Well, don't don't hesitate to call them. So rethink the process, and, and we would rather have you call more often if there are issues. And if things aren't getting resolved, I mean, the, the help desk software is designed to let Tyler and me know if something is sitting around too long not being resolved. But, and, and that's good. That's how it should be. Um, we don't want to rely on you to let us know if there's a problem. But having said that, if there's a problem, let us know. Call Tyler. Call me. Um, tell us what's going on, and we will fix it. Well, I think the other issue we, we were dealing with at that time, and I wasn't making it, it was the automation contact in our building, and she felt that she was it, she was being blamed. It was always her fault. It didn't work. She was doing something. So she did this or something else, and that's why it didn't work. And you know that that doesn't help either. <laughs> so um, to get us back to the agenda item, um, if, if you're good with the words on paper or on the web form. Um, our thought process was that we would um, have this ready to launch and talk about it, sort of have the same kind of conversation as the main user group, and then um, and then have people re up, so um, then have a time frame like by the first of June or mid -Ju mid June or something where the sites would have to get back. Understanding that that time frame doesn't maybe work the best at school do that process with you come August and September. Because you may have staffing changes yeah. during the summer that, you know, heaven forbid the person who <laughs> gets signed up in May is pink flipped in May. Uh, so. Is there any way to contact the paperwork to be sent to the director and not necessarily to the uh, changer? Um, I would think that we would tend to start this at the yeah. director level. Because this is a this is a staffing assignment, Good. so okay. you will make the assignment, Peggy, as to whether or not who it is at Albert Lee, and so we'll probably since this is going to be an individual form, you will tell you send the link to whichever staff members you feel okay you want to complete. It. Well, I mean, yeah. And actually, as as director, we are requiring that your name and acknowledgement go on here as well. And that's how it was on the old form. Well, you just make the comment, you know, that whether they want to re-up or not. And I thought, well, I no, it, it is not. It, it's re-up. If they want to re-up, it's not them. It's, it's your choice. This is truly, this is, this is job assignments. This is workflow. This is schedules. This is pay grades, job descriptions, comp work studies, union negotiations are all affected by some of this stuff. So it, it'll be at the director or the media specialist, generalist make the decision. Yes. Just one quick thing, if if you're using the form and they do want to designate more than one person, should you have a spot for more than one or you want to fill up the form um, We just want an individual form for each person. <laughs> that, that makes it a lot easier to keep track of. That way we can pull one out if something changes and we don't have to try and change the existing information. Okay. All right. Anything else on that? Good. Thank you. All right. Consulty debrief. Okay. Um, two weeks ago, yes, Cheryl and I went off to Salt Lake City to go to the Kasugi Conference. That's not redundant, I don't know. I have to remember what Kasugi actually stands for. Um, which is the conference for the users of Circe Dynamics products, which for us would be Enterprise, and also includes Symphony for the most part. Sorry, Horizon and Enterprise, both the same company. So we went out there and attended several sessions to find out what is coming up, um, what we can do with what we already have available, things like that. Um, some highlights, unless you want to go first, Cheryl? Sure. Okay, go for it. I need to bring up the page on my computer. Um, so their big push for the last <laughs> few years at the conference has been what they call Blue Cloud. Their Blue Cloud, which stands for Best Library User Experience. And basically what they're trying to do is move the client modules into a web-based browser system. So slowly over, they say the next five years, so I think probably eight to ten, they, <laughs> they are going to try to move us all away from our little Horizon clients that we log into to a website. And then that's where we would be doing our cataloging, our searching, our app, our serials, all that kind of stuff. 
So that's kind of their, their big push. The first one, the first module they're working on is cataloging, so I went to a couple sessions on that. The first release is, well, the first release last year they said was going to be this spring. Now they're saying sometime late summer, so we'll see. Um, uh, they're basically moving some very basic functionality from the client for cataloging to the browser. So to go to OCLC, you wouldn't have to log in to a separate website. You wouldn't have to save your file. You wouldn't have to load it in. You would go to your Horizon client on the cloud and pull up your brief on order record or whatever record you're working in. You would pull up your OCLC record on the other side of your window and you can drag and drop fields over. You can merge things. So it'll have some basic functionality. The first release will be a lot like that. And then as they release more and more versions, they're slowly going to move the functionality of the client to these modules in the browser. So that was kind of their big push um, again. And they're getting closer. They're getting closer, they say. Um, so I went to a couple sessions on that. I went to a couple very specific horizon system type things. Um, I went to a lot of RDA sessions. There are a lot of RDA sessions. Um, how people are using horizon, how people are preparing, what sort of tools you are using. Um, I also was lucky enough to get to go a day early. Um, to attend an RDA workshop with Robert Maxwell. I don't know if you guys know who he is. He is kind of a cataloging rock star, if they exist. And <laughs> so, yeah, come on, it's Robert Maxwell. Yeah. He's, written, he's like literally written a lot of the books on cataloging. So, you know. Get his autograph. No. <laughs> but he's called Bob. <laughs> they call him Bob. So I can now call him Bob if I ever see him on this team. <laughs> so, <laughs> he's there a lot of books on cataloging. Anyway, so I got to attend a session, which was nice because there are a lot of Horizon and SMC people, and so we had a lot of some conversations about specifically what other people are doing in their ILS got a lot from the conference and then the RDA sessions and then some of those horizon specific sessions. I learned a lot. I've already implemented a couple things. A few other things will start when we have our first RDA class in April. Here. Yeah, the most, well, probably about half of my sessions either Mirror or Cheryl, but I was in there with her, so I don't need to cover too much on those. One of the big ones that I attended did have to do with setting up the SMS text messaging, which doesn't Sounds like it's going to be too painful, but we'll see how that goes when we actually get to the point of doing that. That's where I was able to get some of those numbers for you. Um, then I also attended a few on web reporters to see what we can do there. Um, for the most part, stuff that self is already aware of, but it was good to get some refreshers on that. And as Cheryl said, there was a fair amount on the back end of Horizon for us to look into. <laughs> stuff that I barely want to know about. You probably don't. Uh, um, other than that, yeah, they were just really pushing the whole cloud thing. Q&A was pretty tame. The one thing that is in there that I am still unsure about is their Blue Cloud Analytics, which is meant to be a reporting tool to go along with the Blue Cloud. I'm still not sure if it's meant to be an upgrade to Web Reporter or not. It sounds like it's meant to be a supplement, and it is also a value-added service for them. So something we'll have to think about when it's actually released, what it actually does, and how much it costs. Um, there was one session we went to um, on Horizon Team Administration. The great thing about these sessions is that the Cersei Dynex people that we call their help desk are in these sessions. So we kind of can ask them questions. Or they're the presenters sometimes. Yeah, or sometimes they're the presenters. Um, one of the things in that Horizon Administration class or session that they highlighted was that they are trying to move to a model that I believe they followed with Symphony, where instead of doing these large client updates where we have to be down for three days, they are moving to smaller service pack updates so that libraries aren't don't have the same amount of downtime that they've had in the past. So. For example, says it's going to 753 next. The next one for the release will be 752, which we're currently on, service pack one. Which is expected to come out, I think, late second quarter. They recognize that 
any downtime is. Yes, that was one of their plus ones. Okay. They're trying to be more iterative with their updates. See how it works out. <laughs> Did you feel like with the RDA session, the way we're um, handling things, we're on right on track? I felt like we were leaps and bounds ahead of a lot of people. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, Steve, one of the sessions I went to, he was like, "Have a small group meeting to decide what local practices you're going to be doing." I'm like, "We've been doing that for six months or so to prepare for all the training that we're then going to." So, and other people in the room hadn't even, you know, we've been talking about what we're going to do with the GMD and format. Other people hadn't even, you know, realized that that's going away or that's going to be an issue. So we really, not to choose my own point, but, you know, we've been working on this for a while. We've been very aware of it and working on it. And I have good people that, you know, especially uh, both Becky and Christy, because Christy in particular didn't even learn ACR2, she started off learning our Jerry. So, so she hey, was being... Jerry, Jerry, cover your ears. So, yeah, I think we're in a good position. Good. Are there any other questions or comments? Or? Okay, so we are at the point of adjournment. Could I, could I just interject some real quick from yeah. the, for those of us who attend the library tech conference? Mm -hmm. um, one thing I would like to maybe, maybe we could bring up this committee or maybe um, you guys could look into it is Collection HQ was a session I attended mm -hmm. and I became, I've been interested in it for a while, but this certainly showed, I think, the potential of it. I'm not convinced on how it work in our, how well it would work in our consortium, but, um, for those who aren't familiar, it's basically analytics of collections, you know, gives you reports on dead materials, trying to get you to do something with them, move them out, or um, they actually use an environment where they have floating collections. So they find it's really cool to find dead material, but then they'll push it out to another library, maybe instead of getting rid of it, and then it will circulate again at that other library because it's new to that collection. So that is one of the advantages with a floating collection that wouldn't work necessarily in a consortial environment. But the software does all sorts of analytics like this um, that, you know, I don't, I don't know the price or anything like that either, but um, for a statistics happy person like myself, that would be pretty awesome to have, I think. And Donovan so, can address that. I could actually tell you something okay. on that. Um, we're, we're in our budgeting process right now, so I'm, I'm working on a, a departmental budget request um, for Ann and Amy. And one of the things we're doing is investigating a few potential new services, and Collection HQ is one of them. Um, Rachel's been doing the uh, legwork on that. I know she has a quote from them. I haven't seen it yet. She and I have a meeting um, early next week where she's supposed to show me everything she's come up with. So uh, the big question, just from what I've been told so far, is really how's it going to work in a consortial environment? It's that question we always seem to come back down to. Is it for everybody? Are we going to let libraries pick and choose? How does the pricing work? Blah, blah, blah. So, uh, yeah, we are investigating that because it does look really cool. You're right. And it makes it makes sense to me, especially if, if we've done all this work at your at the local level to weed and do inventory and get the records up to date, then let's put in some easy tools that or some tools that make that continuation of that process easier so that we don't get ourselves 10 years from now and we say, oh my goodness, we've got a gazillion titles out there that really should have been off our shelves because we don't have space or, so yeah, we're, we're looking at that one. Well, and speaking to that point, you know, one thing now is people are encouraged to maybe run these reports on Web Reporter to come up with some sort of metrics to weed their collections. Well, Collection HQ, you would set these parameters sort of in the beginning, um, you know, again, consortium environment, I don't know who is in charge of setting parameters, or if you can do it by location. I think I, I think you can do it by location. Well, you have to do it by location. Yeah. And then Selco could maybe send out, just all they have to do is hit a button and send out a report and just say, here are some suggested. You, you, you don't want me. 
setting the parameters, but I thought that. No, was you're you're exactly right. It does look really cool. Yeah. yeah ideally, we'd want it done by library and automate. The, my understanding is that the process is basically automated. So you just get reports periodically on your collection and how it compares to similar to collections of similar libraries, not necessarily just within the Selco region. Um, yeah. So yeah, and the people who work on Web Reporter, yeah, really would like to see that happen. <laughs> and so, yeah. Yeah, the person who did the presentation at the tech conference was from Great River, right? Yes, and they're on Horizon. And they're, they're on Horizon, but they are 32 libraries. That is main headquarters, St. Cloud, with branches, lots of centralized selection, one budget, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But it's really awesome, and I would love to see it happen. Okay, right. We're going to see if we can make it work. We're going to try and make it work. And if you need help investigating, I would love to. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, are there any other comments or anything else? Because we are at the end of the agenda, except I would like to discuss meeting dates. I see that the user group calls prior to the main meeting. Yeah. Will you need input and or any other conversations um, prior to that user group meeting? I, I don't think I will, other than what we can do through email, just as easily. Okay. I think we'll be okay. So we will. We're thinking that um, uh, the bulk of the May user group meeting is going to be automation, contact, discussion, and enterprise. Okay. The enterprise will have gone into a quasi-live state. Yep. It will be beta for library staff. So, and I, I, if you don't mind that, I should mention real quick, normally in the um, meeting right before users group, we ask for input on topics. We chose not to do that this time because this one really is going to be pretty enterprise heavy. Okay. Um, so, we, we decided to bypass that this time. No, I'm, I'm totally accepting. So, as of what we are, what, what I've been hearing from the table then is that our April 18th meeting, unless um, it deemed necessary because of some change, major change, we will probably not meet on the 18th of April, we'll meet May 16th? Correct. Okay. But if you want to keep it on your calendars, then Donovan, Tyler, and I can double check okay. as it gets closer. You know. Even email tomorrow asking for topics. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, yeah, because we're so late. Yeah, we yeah. We because we moved this meeting yeah. a week. Okay, so, but as of right now, we'll all assume that it probably won't happen on the 18th, and our next meeting will be the 16th with the users meeting happening prior to that meeting. And well, Coach Charlie really does have to be here in May. <laughs> yeah, what's the deal, dude? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll get the call. Yeah. All right, thank you guys. Maybe all right. Thank you for the notepad. Yeah, thanks.